Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our webinar. It's the last in our Digital Week series, and uh, we've heard a lot about the different aspects of digitalization. Um, but what organizational structures help you actually to master the challenges of digital transformations? Could teams be an answer or team-based structures? I'm very happy to have Dean Professor Winfried Ruhlberg with me today. He will explore this question with us. So with, without much further ado, let me welcome Winfried. Winfried, very many uh, thanks for being here with us today. And um, have a good time, and you too. Thank you, Friederike. Um, thank you all for, uh, for joining, for signing in. Um, the idea of the uh, uh, Digital Week has been to explore different aspects of digitalization, what are the challenges, what does it mean, and uh, the purpose of this talk is then to look at the, um, um, uh, the, the, the imp implications, the organizational implications. Now I need to see if I can get all this to work. No, that's the wrong one. So now I need to get back into the... Um, this is the right one, got it. Um, and the idea is that uh, um, I will guide you through these uh, uh, slides, which by the way, will also uh, uh, be available. And um, um, uh, let, me, let, me, let me immediately summarize the main point. The main point is the way we're currently organizing the managing organizations is not working. There are too many challenges. And the answer, I claim, are teams. Maybe not the only answer, but it's an important answer. However, and unfortunately, teams are often poorly managed. So we need to find ways to get teams to work well. We need to help organizations and teams to perform well. That's the idea. So to, to um, um, refer back to some of the things we talked about earlier this week, um, there's a lot of talk um, uh, about a digital shift, and we explored what this digital shift really is, what it entails. Um, no need to explain that further. In addition, not unimportantly, there are also some other shifts that are happening, and they're reinforcing each other. The global shift, there's a demographic shift in terms of aging, in terms of migration, and there's also different um, gender patterns, um, um, which all lead to the rise, I'm sure many of you have heard this, of the so-called VUCA world, the world becoming more volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Um, the first two rather refer to changing markets, where markets are both become more volatile and also we don't really see very far. It's become a foggy world in terms of um, looking forward. But also uh, organizations within organizations and the way we organize value chains are becoming both more complex and it's not always clear what is the right answer, i.e. ambiguity. Is there a right answer? What is the right answer? So that refers to strategy and structure. And <clears throat> here's the challenge. After everything we talked about this, this week, at the same time, our brains are wired differently. Um, we are used to thinking, to observing, and participating in a linear world. Uh, our brains are wired in such a way. We are learned to see danger somewhere and to respond to that danger, to think through how can we um, uh, confront such a danger. So that's also the way we often think about organizations. Many organizations have a linear approach in a way that I tried to indicate on the slide here, which is the environment is changing, all oh, digital transformation, uh, global shift, and uh, there's the um, um, demographic shift. So uh, that has implications on how well we are performing. As a result of that, we need to adjust our strategy so that we'll do better in the future. And if we've adjusted our strategy and we've, we've defined a strategy, then, then after that, we need to uh, uh, readjust our structure. Um, we need to think our structure and then we need to implement it. Once we got that sorted, we need to find maybe different people, the right people to, ser to serve in such an organizational structure in order for that structure to work well. Well, you can see this is a cascade of decisions in a very linear session, in a very linear, linear, linear manner. That's all well and good and that worked well for the past, but time bomb on the right bottom uh, uh, corner, uh, this is not necessarily the way organizations should be run in the future. Organizations don't really have the time anymore uh, uh, for, for such a staged, sequential process. On top of that, um, a lot of people of us aren't necessarily happy where they then appear in organizational structure. Look at the poor man here and where in this structure he appears. 
this is um, uh, not good news for, for the gentleman. And in a way, it assumes that employees do not really know a lot. Well, that's of course, that's clearly wrong. Universities, University of Applied Sciences and so on. I mean, educational institutions, we've developed people um, who are professionals in their own way. Indeed, many people are professionals with people higher up in their organizations, not really knowing the details of what they're doing. If I only ask my, I mean, I, my colleagues in, in the room here who run the webinar know much more of the technology and everything than I do. I don't know anything and I'm grateful for their specialization, for their professionalism. So executives don't know a lot. They know certain things, but it's all about the right combination and, and utilizing the strengths um, or, or on each level. Of course, this specialization leads to silos. It promotes silos. That's one of the uh, basic challenges that organizations are facing today. People that organizations are, that you're stuck within one silo. It's either your functional silo or it is your, maybe your business unit. You don't really talk a lot with people from other silos, whether from a different unit, from a different function, or from a different country area. And that is not good. Certainly not if those lines are hierarchical instead of lateral. Because it's a great way for innovations to get stuck. Um, and what is the result of all that? It kills motivation. Unfortunately, a lot of people today aren't as motivated as they could be or as they would like to be. So um, um, we've learned a lot from agile um, uh, modes of organizing. And of course, those of you who are at home in the IT business, this is something that emerged in the IT business. But interestingly, that is moved well beyond the world of, um, uh, of IT, not just the companies that you can see here on the right-hand side. But, um, some of you, if you're from the Netherlands, you may know this image. It is, and in the, in the slides, I, I will put a, a URL, uh, a link. This is an image of ING Bank, a traditional bank that does the traditional sort of retail wealth uh, management uh, uh, things that a bank would do. They have and uh, for a decent part of their organization, transformed to a team-based structure. Not been easy, there have been all kinds of challenges, but they made that journey and they continue on the journey. And if you, if you just look at the website, it's, it's um, uh, amazing uh, what this has meant in terms of uh, different organizational structures, in terms of the role of teams, and um, in particular, um, uh, how this has uh, made all the difference for employees in the organizations, how it's taking them seriously. So, um, uh, there was a piece in the uh, Harvard Business Review not long ago that says, we shouldn't be afraid, we should embrace agility. Well, that's all great and good. Um, uh, how do you do that? Well, indeed, we can see that not just ING, but also companies in a range of other industries are trying to make exactly such a transformation. They're, these are early days, right? I can't say that this is really a trend we can really see moving, but I think we're seeing key trends developing here. Now, what do these companies have in common? Well, they are all in a hyper-competitive environment. They all face rapid development cycles. And that's important because they need to take into uh, the equation different pieces of knowledge, technological, um, marketing-wise, understanding of foreign markets, um, uh, uh, a lot of managerial, financial uh, te techniques that are necessary, those combined specialties need to somehow, or those individual specialties need to somehow be combined. And that's exactly what teams come in. Okay, now, I want to hear from you, right? Let's make this interactive. I'm still lo looking at you in the camera, but try and make this interactive. I would like you to, uh, to uh, I mean, it's, it would be great if you can answer the following questions. Teams in my organization are working effectively. I can already see some of you voting here. That is great. And let's, uh, let's uh, see some of the, um, uh, the questions, uh, a lot, some of the answers coming in here. Um, I, I need to move a bit to the uh, screen here. Um, I'm not going to influence you too much, but there's not a lot of change here. So a lot of people are, most people are, have voted at the moment. I'm just looking at my colleagues here. Are we aware at a stage where many people have, have voted? So just to give you the answer, 61% of you have said no. No, teams in my organization are not working together effectively. And if, if you voted no, you are not just, I mean, this poll shows it, but 
All the research that I've done suggests you're not alone. Unfortunately, there are many um, uh, people who are in the, um, the same situation. I need to click this away from my screen, and that has worked. Um, this is in a way odd, because aren't we social beings? Aren't we humans great team players? Indeed, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that we indeed are great team players. Um, there's evidence, I mean, in, 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 in a lot of evidence also nowadays in journals such as Science that's been, that's been published that identifies that even specialists, even people who are very strong in a given area, perform better in teams. Well, let's think about it. So even special, even the geek, if you're listening here, you think, well, that could be me. Well, that's interesting then. So that means even if you're a geek, you will perform better if you work with non-geeks. Work with people who may not be as, as much of a specialist as you are, but they bring in something else. They bring in expertise, um, they find ways to maybe connect to the outside world, they may be able to translate, for instance, a great innovation into a product that subsequently has a chance in the market. Right, so we, the teams, are, people are cognitive team players. It's only if you're a specialist, if you're a geek, and you're confronted with people on your team um, who are absolute nitwits, who know nothing of the business, only then you're more likely to perform better individually. But how often is that the case if recruiting um, is done well? So the future really resides in teams. But at the same time, we've just seen 61% of you said teams are not working well. In fact, comparing that with some other evidence, some other polls that I've done, uh, th th this is still a pretty optimistic audience. I've seen um, uh, I'm not kidding you here, uh, with top companies, I've seen up to 100% of teams, of people indicating our teams are not performing well. So, good audience. Um, let me see if I can get this to, yes. So, so uh, one of our questions is, how then can we get teams to become more effective? And that's a project that I would like to share with you. It's a project that we started, uh, where we have some first results but we're still very much in the stage of still collecting further data um, uh, and, and, and developing our, our, our model. One of the things we've been asked, we, 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 three study, we believe that teams that are managed effectively will help companies not just become more successful, but also a better and more pleasant place to work. Very important first step. Then, what we try to do is we, we try to develop a framework we're co-developing that with a series of uh, partners or business partners that allow us to understand, to measure, and subsequently manage both team level and individual behavior, individual behaviors within teams. So we try to connect the dots between the team level and the individual level. And we believe that if we use the right sort of metrics in the right way, then we can achieve this our first objective, which is to make a team a better place to work and to make teams more successful. Now, it's all good and great, but uh, we saw, we seen, we've seen earlier, a lot of teams are not working well. So why do teams fail? Well, there are the, we came up with six key criteria. The first three are rather hygiene factors, where, however, still there can be uh, issues. The first hygiene factors is that simply, objectives are not aligned. This may sound banal, but it's one of the key reasons, it's, it's a key reason why teams fail. What we did is we developed a questionnaire that allows us to measure the extent to which team, which individuals' objectives, those individuals serving on a team, their objectives are aligned. And um, uh, the simple, not surprising answer is, the more aligned individuals' objectives that are serving on the same team are, the more uh, the, um, uh, the, um, um, uh, the successful the team. So we need instruments to monitor individual team level and ultimately also firm level objectives. Secondly, again, not surprising, inadequate resources. However, this is a major problem. Um, clearly, um, the, um, teams that, that, that function need the adequate financial time, but also human resources in order to serve uh, adequately. And then thirdly, context. Quite often a context is not supportive, um, which um, um, may be for all kinds of reasons, quite possibly because of 
um, uh, political uh, differences within your organizations, some units uh, like the development, some units do not like, as a result, are not willing to support. Clearly, if the political environment, if the social, the cultural environment is not functioning, the, um, uh, the odds for the team to perform well are just worse. Okay, this in a way all makes, makes a lot of sense. Let's now look at some um, uh, genuine team factors. Why do teams fail? Well, a lot has to do with composition. Composition is suboptimal. And then everybody's sitting here thinking, or listening, thinking, yes, indeed. I mean, it, uh, the others are not working or aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, that's possibly true. Um, um, have, do you, have you been on teams where there were many high performers on your team and yet the team was not successful? I'm sure some of you are listening and nodding yes. It's exactly the situation that I recognize. I've also been on such teams. It can be very frustrating. If you have a lot of high performance, performers on a team, it doesn't necessarily mean that the team will perform well. If you all have Ronaldo's, you may have a great offense, but how are you going to do with the defense? Ronaldo isn't always like, doesn't always want to defend. Okay, this is a football statement. It's probably the only one I'm going to make uh, during the talk. So what we need is, we need, measure, we, we need instruments to measure, to understand um, um, surface level and, 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 and deep level diversity. I'll repeat that and I'll explain what I mean with it. Surface level diversity refers to issues such as well, demographic diversity, but more importantly, experiential diversity. So do you have, div do you have uh, diversity from within your organization, possibly also from uh, other organizations, and possibly from different uh, industries? We know that these three factors are major drivers of team success within organizations. Then um, uh, what about the team, uh, the, the time you've been worked together with other people on the team? The simple uh, uh, effect is that the longer you've been on the same team with other people, the better the team will work because you start better understanding the other person. So if, you've, if you have um, uh, certain routines that you can develop as team members, and certainly also if the team leader has been on the same team with individual members in the past, that will facilitate integration within the team. So what we've done, what we've done is we've developed instruments to measure this, and as a result of that, we can predict the effectiveness of team, of the result of team composition on subsequent performance. Of course, it's not a one-on-one -on -one relation. Um, uh, there's other factors that play a role, the, the ones I mentioned earlier and the, and the ones I'll mention afterwards, but it's remarkably uh, powerful. Then another aspect uh, is deep level diversity. That rather refers to psychological variables. Um, if you put all people uh, who are very action-oriented, who want to do things, but actually don't want to spend a lot of time trying to implement, take the time to maybe build um, uh, the tools, the instruments that uh, had been uh, discussed in an uh, enthusiastic brainstorming sessions had been de have been developed, then the team will not be successful because there's all, all words, no action. Not good, right? So you need also, in that sense, you need a certain balance. So we're working with um, uh, established psychological instruments to also measure that aspect of team uh, performance, of, of, of team composition. Um, a second major element is, of course, leadership. Um, uh, once people are working together on a team, that's the, na the nature of being human is that we have our issues, we have our differences. But that can be very productive uh, and, and, and as a result can improve performance, can lead to uh, exciting discussions in a, an environment which um, um, is, is, is challenging or it can frustrate progress. And then it's all a matter of how do you deal with conflicts? So what we, we, what we do is we try to measure how, what is the conflict culture in the organization and very much what's the nature of the leader in there. In that context, we've also developed a notion called we consciousness. To what extent Define team. Do, do team members define themselves as a member of that team? We found that to be a very powerful predictor of subsequent um, team performance. If I define myself as a member of a team, even if I'm not the smartest, even if I'm not the best employee, but that purely that fact that I define myself as a, as a team member increases the odds of the team being successful. It's remarkable, and we can measure that over time. 
So um, we um, uh, develop, are developing and have developed a range of instruments to monitor behaviors, emotions, uh, mental models. And finally, um, we believe that teams aren't always doing the best job possible using the available metrics in order to measure performance. And certainly not to link team performance to those other variables that we talked about. And I think that's the, the, next, the next generation. What we are, what we're seeing in, in, of course, and that's what digitalization also plays a role, we are having at our disposal a much wider range of metrics that we can and should use in our um, management, in our day-to-day -day operations, in order to understand what drives success of our teams, what drives performance. And I think, and, and, and many companies are, are, are I mean, when, when we talk to them initially, I mean, they don't, they may be not admit it, but I think many of you are listening here um, um, thinking that's exactly what I can imagine. It's, uh, we, we can use a lot more and we're, we're exploring together with countries and how we can do that. We have been quite modest. No, we haven't. We, we thought, we thought, well, let's call this our Sengalen top team model. Top team, because we want all teams to become top teams, right? So the six factors that I mentioned to you earlier, those three hygiene factors and those three um, uh, uh, team related factors, we put in a, in, in a simple model. There's much more underneath each of those boxes. So there's scans, tools, instruments that we've developed um, or that we've been using uh, because other um, uh, colleagues, other uh, researchers or, or consultants have developed adequate models uh, that, that one can work with. So that's the, um, the, the basic idea of our, um, of, our, um, um, of, our, of our project. So it is really a project. We've just begun to roll out this project with a number of, of companies um, where the idea always is we measure a whole range of teams. So it's not just 10 or 20. No, this has to be data oriented. We need data for a lot of individuals on a lot of teams because only then um, uh, we can come up with statements that will help you, will help managers, leaders run the teams better. So <clears throat> um, as I said, we just started rolling out uh, our model at selected companies. Um, uh, we do that to a large extent through a dedicated pl platform, um, uh, internet-based, where team provide data. Um, um, uh, after delivering that data, we analyze, we produce a report that um, uh, goes back to the team and the individual, the individual teams and, and to the client in ways which of course we discuss. Some, uh, some information only goes to the team, doesn't go to the client. Um, of course, always depending on what we what we agree with. Very important, the platform does not own the data. We own the data. Also important in terms of GDPR, in terms of data privacy. Uh, and at the same time, we make sure we do not know the names, individuals involved, right? So that there's impartiality, there's neutrality on both sides. Um, uh, in this process, of course, what we are hoping and expecting, and what we're seeing is that our partners are helping us to co-develop the model. This is... I'm, I'm, I'm convinced the organizational model of the future, but we don't really know what exactly it will look like. If I go back one step um, in, in time, about 100 years ago, in 1920, General Motors introduced the multi-divisional structure. 1920. It took us maybe 50 years or longer to optimize and to develop that model further. So we will with this new team-based structure emerging, we will certainly need a long time to develop that further to understand where are teams adequate, where, um, and where and how can we make the best uh, use of them. So this then concludes my, uh, uh, the, the time that I had uh, prepared for you. I think um, um, uh, Federica will join us again and I'm looking forward to your questions, um, which I will try to answer to, uh, the, the, in the best way possible. Thank you very much, Winfried. I will stop the screen sharing and start with the first questions. Many have arrived already. Please go ahead and send us more. You can also upload those you find most relevant. Um, start with the first one. How about culture, for example, hidden agendas, trust, competitiveness, grouping? How do you deal with that kind of stuff? A very big question. Um, to to, some aspects of it. Yeah, um, I mean, but it's, but it's a crucial question. So, so most important, we try to capture that in, in the... Um, uh, in the, in, in the part uh, of leadership and team process, right? So what we try to do is exactly measure aspects of team culture. So I mentioned what is the culture of dealing with conflicts. 
another example is what is the culture of we conscious so in, in the extent to what extent do we have a shared mindset do we believe it is important to have a shared mindset or do we rather have a culture of distance where you do your thing i do my thing and we don't really care so to what extent are, do we have a culture of integration you know, exchange or rather of of of, of distance there's of course there's an, a broader notion of organizational culture that would be part of the context. So we would try to measure the extent to which, um, in the organization, uh, the, the 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 political and cultural environment is supportive of um, of a rollout of, um, of of teams. And then the, the the third the third level would be that of national culture. Yes, that also plays a role. And I um, uh, there's I mean at, at this point the honest answer is we don't know. Um, uh, it, one of my colleagues on this very project, Thomas Casas, uh, lives in Shanghai half of his time. The other time, the other half, he's with us in St. Gallen, and uh, he's done research on Chinese teams for exactly this question. For, the, for this reason, we want to understand in what way do also national does national culture affect um, uh, some of these processes we're looking at. So, an open question, and it's not not we, we we have ideas, we have clues. Um, Ideally, we would at some point build a large data set and we would be able to filter out national culture, organizational culture, and team culture variables. So that's an academic answer, but it's an, it's an important question. Thank you. Um, hi, Jay. Um, how does this change the leadership capabilities needed at different levels, executive level, middle, line mm -hmm. management? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think what it, what, it mean, what it means is it's becoming much more important so in the, in the let me in the past people would come would rise in the organization based on okay I've always a marketer and become a better marketing person so eventually I hope to become a chief marketing officer who knows I might some some point I might might become the CEO or same in the finance um, um, uh, 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 sort of career um, I think that's going to change I think we will see much more in the future that um, um, functional careers may be still a way. Um, um, to senior uh, senior roles, but what is much more important is that uh, leaders will become bridge builders. The essence of a good leader, I believe, is to be a bridge builder. A bridge builder between different competencies, between different pockets of knowledge. So we have the techie, uh, we've got the marketing person, we've got a finance person, we've got a person who understands um, um, uh, different kinds of expertise, or maybe different national geographical markets, um, and the team leader could even be the CEO on, on a top management team uh, would be the person to um, to moderate to mediate and in fact uh, uh, my, co my, my, my colleagues and I wrote a paper on this in a journal leadership quarterly where we asked exactly this question what we found is that if we have credible overlaps between my personal experience my profile on the one end and that of individual team members that increases the likelihood of the leader's success. And that overlap may be in different ways. For instance, maybe for a while I've worked in finance. At some point I've stopped following the latest aspects of finance, but if I'm the CEO, um, I might still be able to use a language that the CFO will understand, even though the CFO knows more of finance than I do as a CEO. Then I might have a head of, let's say, the Americans on, on the executive uh, uh, team, and I might have spent some time in the United States, or I might enjoy going for holidays there. I might, I might, just, I might understand that part of the region. And I use a different kind of language in order to um, um, explain to that person what it is that a finance person is looking for, and vice versa. Then maybe I have uh, spent time in a different business unit, and I use that language in order to maybe uh, address the head of that specific business unit. Do you see what I'm, I'm, I'm saying? It is about bridging. It is about boundary spanning, and that's important. Because, but that's also, I mean, we didn't have much time to explain some of the drivers of the team-based structure. We are living in a world of increasing specialization. We are all, companies are becoming more and more specialized. Within companies, we're seeing more specialization. I'm not an IT person, so I might expect that IT people understand what they're doing, uh, and what they're, what, what also what they, that they understand of each other what they're doing. Actually, that's not always the case. IT hardware people often don't understand what IT software people are doing. In fact, IT software people, if you don't know certain software, you don't know, and you probably don't know, and you're probably as ignorant as I am as a non-IT person. So what I'm saying is increasing specialization, and we need, we need people, people bridge builders. And, and that means 
the, what I've just explained, and it also means social skills. It also means social competencies. It's very important. The willingness to, to be courageous, to learn, to admit that you don't know what, um, that there's a lot of things that you don't know, but that you can broker compromise, that you can broker a way out. That's where I see the role of leaders to, to move in the future. It will require a lot of courage, and um, um, it will be less of a, a playbook, which is relatively easy. If I just tick these, these boxes, I'll be a good, a good leader. Those, the, those days increasingly will be gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the next twist questions also go into the direction of unbossing and how yeah. much will we still need leaders uh, and what are the, your views on self-organizing teams, for example? Um, I had a long discussion with that with a uh, with a former student and and, and, and uh, entrepreneur here, Sangal and uh, alumnus. Not long, uh, I mean, early this week. Um, I think that it, I think that depends, but I think to the extent possible. Um, I mean, I, 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 I'm by, almost by definition personally in favor of unbossing. Right? The, the fewer bosses, the better. The more decentralized, the better. Um, of course, there's still um, uh, rules and principles uh, that you can have, but maybe in some respects. I mean, one person is a boss. Uh, that's also what this. Um, um, uh, a colleague mentioned, and another question: another person is the boss. Um, is this always possible? To be honest, I don't know. To be honest, I'm a bit. I, I, there's an element of idealism because we've we've been through such discussions before. I remember in the 1990s, I was part of a research project on what we then called innovative forms of organizing, and it was all about delayering, delaying as in cutting out layers out of the organization, about empowerment flattening of the organization well despite and we thought technology is driving it uh, global competition is driving it but actually we haven't really seen it so i'm a bit suspicious of our human ability to at some point bring hierarchies back in and um, um, uh, but I, but I, but I, what i do think is we will see competition of different modes of different ways of running the organization and such competition will be fascinating uh, because we will see like a, uh, a laboratory of, of live experiments of individuals and teams and companies trying out different forms. And I think out of that sort of a, a, a new uh, team-based structure will develop. Whether it's going to be bossless, mm, I'm a bit suspicious of that. But um, uh, if, we can, if we can pull that off, whoever asked the question, if we can pull that off, I would, I would for one, would be very happy, and I'm sure that some other people listening would be very happy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, another question um, about this topic, um, how to really get to an unboss or a culture or with pure hierarchies or an agile way of working, um, isn't the change that teams and individuals have to go through the toughest, toughest part, how do you yeah. address that? Yeah. Well, I believe the first, I mean, the step is to, to start measuring, right? I mean, it requires, I mean, some, some, some companies, uh, I mean, we have this discussion all the time, right? And then we ask, but do you have teams in your organization? Yeah, yeah, we do a lot, of, we do have a lot of teams. Okay, so let's start. And what do you actually, what do you know about those teams? How do you manage them? Um, I'm, I must say, I'm sometimes disappointed. Not to say, su well, surprised by the lack of of of, anal of, of data of analysis uh, with, of teams within the organization itself. So the, the step forward is, of course, to, to, to try and begin to, be, to begin to measure elements of those teams. And I understand that this is difficult because in, in in the old days you had you had your KPIs, you had your you had your your, your metrics, and we will have to work towards new metrics. Um, and those metrics will, uh, um, I mean, have, have partly maybe not even been developed. That's exactly the purpose of our, of our project. So, so those who are, who, are, who are afraid to start, I would say, well, start with what you are already doing. Start measuring. And, and, and the minute you start to do that, I, a, a lot of companies find this really, really difficult. For very understandable reasons, again, I mean, data privacy, GDPR, and so on. 
um, um, are, are, are part of the reason. Um, but the most important reason is that in, they don't know where to start or what to begin to measure. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what, we, what we're looking for. This one in German, I'll translate. Uh, um, measuring teams can also be seen as uh, interventions that itself have an influence on uh, the performance. How do you go about that? That is, by definition, correct. Um, uh, any, any measurement, any observation is an interaction uh, and may already change behaviors. Um, I mean, there's different way of answer of then of then going on, of continuing. I mean, one 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 thing to say is then okay. So we don't measure in order not to 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 not engage or interact. Is that good management? To be honest, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't think so. I think I think just like we manage performers in organizations in in, in companies, uh, we, me we 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 measure and manage things like cost, where budgets and so on. Why, why would we not do that with teams? Um, what, what, however, the, the, the person asking the question may be concerned with what could that lead to? I think if that's the question, then I think it's a very valid question. Um, because if, if the employer or if the whoever senior executive uh, running such a project uh, does so with, well, intentions that at some point will not be liked or appreciated or of which uh, team members become suspicious, then of course this will collapse. The whole event or the whole the whole team um, so there ha you have to have a degree of uh, well you have to have the right morals uh, in, in doing so but let's assume that you listening to this let's assume you are the weakest link yeah, if you have the UK uh, uh, TV show are you the weakest link well maybe you are the weakest link in this particular team right but maybe we know and that's like, that's why the future lies in my view we will look for can we find a, a better a team where you can perform better and as a result the team will perform better? Because that's what's going to happen. We are going to see that some, some team constellations are not optimal. And by making certain changes, I believe, I hope, that we will make those teams, but also the individual team members, actually happier, not just more productive, but also happier people. Because I'm happier if I see that I'm more productive. Thank you. Um, Winfred, you mentioned the hierarchical organization, that hierarchical organizations do not work. A team-oriented approach to work is better. How would you organize the teams in a large organization replacing the hierarchy? Well, as, well, as I said, I would, I would start step by step. And I would probably, I mean, um, and I would, be, I would make sure that I understand how are our teams probably being composed, how well are they doing. I think that's the, that, that, that is the, 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 the crucial step. So step one is really getting a grip, getting gr a grasp of the organization, of your teams. And with that data, with that information, I'm convinced you will learn so much. You will learn so much of your organization that you'll be, you will derive from that information implications, most likely about how to better put together teams. Um, and, and I think then step by step, based on the organization, based on the market, based on the maturity of, the, of, of, of technology and so on and so on, any organization will have to develop its own path. But it will have to be partly data-driven. Maybe, uh, maybe 20 years from now, we will look back and say, yeah, Winfred, you should have known because it was A, B, C. At this point, we, I mean, at least I do not know. I don't know. Um, but I, I, I'm convinced of one thing. It will have to come from the data within the organization. Thank you. Um, you said the longer a team works together, the more efficient it is or the better it works. Isn't that contradictory to the agile notion itself? Or what time frames are you talking about when you say work together for a long time? Yeah. Good, good, a good question. Um, and yet all the, all the research on teams shows that, um, I mean, and it refers back to that element I mentioned earlier, to, to um, the boundary spanning behavior of team leaders. Um, if you bring together people with all their own specialty, with, with their uh, professional knowledge and expertise, who understand very little of what the other person is or the persons are doing, then this is like a combination of, uh, it's something where the parts 
are not more than the, I mean, the whole is not more than the, the individual parts, right? So in, in, the only way this will work, work well is if you find ways to connect the dots. And, and the dots are being connected um, uh, by having some degree of understanding of each other, by having some experience working with each other. Um, and the, the evidence shows, I mean, in fact, if you're, if, I mean, just one research comment, if you look at, um, I mean, if it's a good paper, good research paper, you always find that team tenure is an important control variable. We typically find that team, uh, that the time people are spent on the team is one important explanatory variable of, of subsequent performance. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean, it doesn't necessarily contradict agility. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that the teams have to be constant all the time. No, maybe at some point, some people leave, some people move to different projects. Uh, it doesn't necessarily destroy the cohesion if there's still some people who know each other, who have worked together, right? You need a certain common base to, 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 to start from. You don't necessarily need um, a, a stable, um, a static a team. That's not what I'm, uh, what, what I'm arguing for here. And it's not the reality anyway. Teams will constantly evolve and constantly Maybe one last question. Um, a lot of major companies are talking diversity in terms of uh, gender, race, sexual orientation, but the mold remains the same to build up a team. In reality, team members have the same qualifications and career aspirations. Isn't that what really needs to be changed? Well, if, 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 the, if, if, the, if the question is, I mean, don't we need more diversity, then I mean, uh, um, I, I, it's very easy for me to say yes. I mean, this is, this is an, an almost a necessity. Um, I mean, with these changes that are taking place at the same time, the digital shift, the fact that we see more and more specialization, um, um, the global shift, um, the demographic shift, we, we will, on average, benefit from having more diversity on a team. Although it is actually also increasing the challenges of bringing these pieces of different kinds of experiences and mindsets together. Again, that is then the role of not just individual members, but also then of the person who is somehow having that role as a team leader. Um, but absolutely, that diversity is a, is a critical um, uh, a requirement. And uh, the more complex, the more unpredictable environments are, the more companies are facing very demanding market circumstances, the more diversity also has advantages. Right, so the more we're moving towards an agile, a digital world, the more we're moving to different markets across Europe, across North America, across Asia, China, India, and so on and so on, the more we need that diversity on teams. Um, so I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, uh, rather more than less of it and rather faster than, than, than postponing it. Oh, thank you so much, Winfried. It's been a pleasure. Do you have any closing remarks? No, apart from what I want to thank all of you for, uh, for uh, signing in and for still being there. Uh, that's, uh, that's great. Um, if you um, uh, are, are interested, feel free to drop me a line. Um, and um, if, if you're interested in your organization to explore with us the possibility of, um, of becoming co-partners in this development, we would very much like to have such a conversation. Um, we, um, um, as I said, we, we are working with a number of companies. We're talking with a, with, with a couple of companies. And um, um, uh, we, at this point, are still very open to um, uh, identify other partners in, in the project. Thank you, Winfred. Thank you also from my side from, uh, for sticking with us, for attending one or up to seven webinars. This was great. And, uh, yeah, if you like this, if you have questions, reach out to us. If you have any feedback, let us know. And um, stay tuned, there will be more um, webinars coming, so be sure to open my emails. So thank you and have a nice evening.